Good morning. Welcome to Epiphany Parish. I'm great. It's great to see you here today. Thank you for joining us online. I have two announcements I want to highlight for you. One is today uh, the Reverend Peter Strymer, who does a lot of teaching here at Epiphany, is going to be starting a new series called The Bodies of Christ. I invite you to tune into that after the service as part of our adult education hour. And the second thing I, I want to really hold up to you is a Music Guild concert that is happening this evening. It is Beethoven's sonatas for violin and piano. Byron Shankman is a great artist, and Ingrid Matthews, a wonderful violinist, are going to be presenting that. So I invite you to find that on Epiphany's website uh, or on YouTube. Incidentally, speaking of websites, we have a new updated website. So I invite you to check that out. Hopefully uh, it is helpful in, in more easily accessing information about Epiphany Parish. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad we're worshiping together. And do remember that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you have a place at Epiphany. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God, you, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world, that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that, having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. For God alone my soul in silence waits. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will you assail me to crush me, all of you together, as if you were a leaning fence, a toppling wall? They seek only to bring me down from my place of honor. Lies are their chief delight. They bless with their lips, but in their hearts they curse. For God alone my soul in silence waits. Truly my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my safety and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in him always, O people. Pour out your heart before him, for God is our refuge. Those of high decree are but a fleeting breath. Even those of low estate cannot be trusted. On the scales they are lighter than a breath, all of them together. Put no trust in extortion. In robbery, take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice I have heard it, that power belongs to God. Steadfast love is yours, O Lord, for you repay everyone according to his deeds.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of the bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's been an exciting few days, if you want to call it that. For some of us, there is hope. For some of us, there's consternation. Indeed, we all have different views of what the future is going to hold going forward. Even if we claim to be part of the same party, we may well have entirely different views of what the future looks like, and, and that's okay. Because we know, many of us who have lived long enough, know that rarely does life work out exactly like we expect it to. And so I want to remind you, I want to remind you who are disappointed with this election that it's not going to be as bad as you think. And I want to remind you, who are exceedingly pleased with this election, that it's not going to be as great as you think. I know that just as you know that because, well, we've seen enough of life. And because, because we know this, I want to remind you, of course, not to gloat or, or not to lash out. Because when we do that, we put both too much false hope in what the future government will do, but also more importantly, we risk, we risk jeopardizing or injuring relationships that we are in. As the Christians, we know that in the kingdom of God, where relationship is primary, God is still God, and God will still be God tomorrow, and God will still be God the day after tomorrow. Those incidentally, are the words that Desmond Tutu spoke to the nation of South Africa after Nelson Mandela was elected president of that country. Archbishop Tutu said, and tomorrow, God is still God. St. Augustine, the fourth century theologian, said it this way, we will not rest until we rest in God. St. Augustine may well have borrowed those words from the sentiment that we find in Psalm 62. We hear it today. I'll read some of it. For God alone my soul in silence waits. From God comes my salvation. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be greatly shaken and the psalmist goes on, put your trust in God always, O people, pour out your heart, for God is our refuge, 
Those of high decree are but a fleeting breath. Even those of low estate cannot be trusted. On the scale, they are lighter than a breath. All of them together. God has spoken once, twice I have heard it, that power belongs to God. Steadfast love is yours, O Lord, for you repay everyone according to their deeds. Brothers and sisters, I'd like you to consider cutting out Psalm 62 from your bulletin and putting it on your desk or maybe on the mirror in your bathroom. And then I'd like to invite you to read it every day between now and Christmas. And maybe even transcribe it, maybe rewrite it, right? Seek to memorize it, take it into your heart. As we in this nation continue to try to navigate the messy aftermath of this presidential election, let us take into our hearts the reality, the bigger reality, that God is still God, remembering that we will not rest until we rest in God, remembering that our souls in silence wait. So put your trust in God. God is still God. I also want you to remember that whoever you are, whatever your political affiliation, whatever your mood this day, you have a place here at Epiphany Parish. Right? Epiphany is your backstop. We have your back. We do. We pray for you. We know you. We hold you in our arms in this building, this place right here. This is built on and attached to the rock that is Jesus Christ. No one thinks, least of all me, that how you voted outweighs the reality that you are made by God. You are made well by God, that you are a beloved child of God. And yes, of course, it is important that we participate in the governance of this country. But our participation is important insofar as it forms our character. Because we live on this earth not as governors of nations, but to be children of God, seeking to grow up in Jesus Christ. We're sojourners. We're, we're pilgrims, not made for this world, but we are made for eternal purpose. We are imagined forth by God in that space that existed before time, before creation, before the first Adam, before the first star, before the Big Bang was any sound at all. There was this space, and God imagined you into being. God gave you your name, and then God waited, and God waited, and God waited, and God waited until right now to put you in the world. There is nothing accidental about your life. There is nothing accidental about your participation in this election. Know this, however, the point of your life is not the vote you cast. The point of your life is how you act as a Christian in the aftermath of this election. The point of your life is how you act as a Christian in the aftermath of this election. And so, I've asked you to memorize Psalm 62, or at least that part about your soul waiting. And I've reminded you the relationship is primary. That's sort of one of our tropes here at Epiphany, isn't it? We say it all the time, that in the kingdom of God, you can finish the sentence, that in the kingdom of God, relationship is primary. Now, we believe this, of course, because we believe in a Trinitarian God. We believe in a relational God. We believe in God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Ours is a God of relationship. Ours is a God of love. Ours is a God that generates love. Ours is a God that gives forth love. Ours is a God that loves you. Ours is a God that loves me. And ours is a God, and this is super important to remember, 
Ours is a God that loves our neighbor as well. So the song, relationship is primary. But I have a challenge for you today as well. I have a challenge for you in the aftermath of this election, and I believe the challenge actually will prove to be a great blessing and a great gift, unanticipated, I suppose, in the aftermath of this presidential election, because I believe this election is going to reveal for you something particularly unique about you. You know, because God's working on us, right? God's forming our character. God never misses an opportunity, even in the messes of life, even in messes like this, maybe most particularly when things are messy. God uses those moments to call us to our best selves. So the word, now making a sermon transition here, the word I want to invite you to consider here is idolatry. Idolatry, you ready? So we're going to go this way now. Idolatry, it's an old-fashioned word, and it simply means that thing which we prioritize over God. That thing we put in line in front of God. That's what an idolatrous idolatry is. So political elections are super spreaders of idolatry because of the passion of the issues they provoke, because of this winner-loser paradigm, because of all the drama. And you know there's been a lot of drama. So the question I'll start with is this. What is that issue that drove you, that really fired you up in this election cycle? Was it security? Was it the economy? Was it character? Was it health care? Was it taxes? Was it abortion? Was it the courts? Was it education? What was it? Write it down. Write it on a post-it note, right? Write it on a post-it note and then take that post-it note and put it on the front of your Bible. Go find your Bible, pull it out, put the post-it note with that word on the front of your Bible. And then take that Bible and open it up and go to the Gospels, go to Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, or John, and take that word and see if you can't place it in the teachings and parables of Jesus. Don't go Old Testament on me, right? Don't go trying to find a withering quote that you can pull out of the Psalms. Go Jesus, right? Go to Jesus and place the priority of your issue, your idolatry, potentially, not necessarily, your issue, put it into Jesus' mouth and listen to what he has to say about it. Okay? So let me, let me tell you a story. It's a story I heard just this week uh, because it came from the mouth of our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, as he was preaching in the basement at St. Augustine's College in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he was telling a story about how a while ago when he was on a sabbatical, though he wasn't planning to, he found himself immersed in the Christian arguments that were made for and against slavery. Okay? And it turns out there's a lot written on this subject because, as you know, there were Christians on both sides of this particular issue. And one group, the one in favor of slavery... And the other group were the abolitionists, right, the, who believed the children of God should never be denied their free will. And so we read the articles and the works by these two groups. And what Bishop Curry discovered was that none of the arguments in favor of slavery ever quoted Jesus. None of them ever used an example from Jesus' life, teachings, or parables. Now, on the other hand, the only examples the abolitionists, those fighting against slavery used, were from Jesus, from the mouth of our Lord. So, flip back to the front of your Bible and take a look at that that word that you put there on the post-it note, that 
that issue, that cause that so fired you up in this election. And ask yourself, how would Jesus present and or defend this issue? And if it's hard for you to square the circle, then you might find yourself up against an idolatry that has wormed its way to the front of the line in your mind's eye, or maybe even in your heart. On the other hand, if the issue is one that is magnified in its glory when it's set in the mouth of Jesus, then indeed it is an idolatry but rather a kingdom of God footpath. And if you find yourself, your issue magnified, glorified, when put in the path of Jesus Christ, when you find yourself on a footpath in the kingdom of God, then I implore you to keep walking. So nothing's wrong with politics. As you know, I'm a personally a big fan of democracy. I think it is theologically relevant because it says something about the freedom we have to choose. And I'm also a fan of these crazy elections because they give us a chance to grow up in Jesus Christ. The passions provoked give us a focus that can redirect us back upon ourselves to see if we are indeed seeking first the kingdom of God or seeking our self-interest first. And so I invite you to find the word to get your blood all boiling and unpack it. Now it could be a thing you are in favor of, like capitalism or taxes, Or it could be a thing that you despise, like capitalism or socialism or taxes. But I encourage you to go there. It may be hard work, I know, because because when you go there, you have to scrape away all the superficial points of policy and and then stir in your personal history and you stir in your own context and, and you stir in your own temperament. And then you come to that place where your kingdom may be bumping up against the kingdom of God. And if you get there, ask the question. Jesus, what would you do? Jesus, how would you respond to this particular topic, my concern? Jesus, what questions should I be asking you? Jesus, what parable would you tell me You see, brothers and sisters, you see, I don't want us to miss an opportunity that has been given to us, I think providentially, by God through this election. I don't want us to miss an opportunity to become more fully the person that God created us to be. After all, we are the Jesus people. We have a teacher who can help call out our idolatry and put our legitimate concerns, the legitimate concerns, in the context of the kingdom of God. I believe this election is a great gift to all of us because it can surface up in each one of us our personal kingdom concerns and then bring us into the larger framework, if we take the time to do so, the larger framework of the kingdom of God. And it is my hope that we go there For to go there, we will find redemption and grace, relationship and unity in the wake of this season of political tumult. I do do believe that the, the high level of personal investment in this election has given us a divine blessing of confronting issues that get in front of the line before Jesus. And the good news is the invitation is to turn around and seek again first the kingdom of God, for God is still God. It is not the outcome of this election that soothes the soul, it is God. Right? For God alone, my soul in silence waits. 
God is my salvation. It is God that is the sturdy rock. It is God who we come to epiphany to worship. God is God today. God will be God tomorrow. And God will be God the day after tomorrow. And Jesus is our personal invitation into the kingdom of God. I am so hopeful for you, and for this nation. I'm so hopeful for this church and for the people of God. I believe that we've been given, oddly, a, a cathartic blessing in this particular season of political tumult that will draw us up out of those things in which we have placed false hope and set us more securely in the life and the teaching and the love of Jesus Christ. He is our rock. He is our salvation today, tomorrow, and the next day. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Fixing our thoughts and desires on holy wisdom, let us offer prayers to God for all the world. For this holy gathering, and for the people of God in every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who minister in Christ, and for all the holy people of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all peoples and their leaders, and for justice and righteousness in the world, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who struggle to establish greater peace upon earth, especially those who serve in the military, uh, those on missions of hope and mercy and their families, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, the suffering and the oppressed, those who are sick and hospitalized, especially Mervyn, Laura, Susan, Beth, Missy, Trish, Olga, Marge, Attie, and for those suffering from COVID-19, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who rest in the hope of the resurrection and for all of the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those on our hearts, 
offering praise and thanksgiving, intercession and solace, comfort and healing for those we now name silently or aloud. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. Governor of nations, our strength and shield, we give you thanks for the devotion and courage of all those who have offered military service to this country, for those who have fought for freedom, for those who have laid down their lives for others, for those who have borne suffering of mind or of body, for those who have brought their best gifts to times of need. On our behalf, they have entered great danger, endured separation from those they love, labored long hours and borne hardships in war and in peacetime. Lift up by your mighty presence those who are now at war, Encourage and heal those in hospitals or mending their wounds at home. Guard those in any need or trouble. Hold safely in your hands all military families and bring the returning troops to joyful reunion and tranquil life at home. Give to us, your people, grateful hearts and a united will to honor these men and women and hold them always in our love and in our prayers until your world is perfected by peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may walk in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Walk in love as God loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord, therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
join me in lifting your bread and your wine. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's countenance be upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever.
Let us bless the Lord. 